Hello and welcome to another episode of the Spoilt Milk Movie Podcast. Today's episode is going to be slightly different to normal. Catty the Hobo and I were unable to meet up, so I'm going to be recording a solo podcast. As always, it will be full of spoilers for the film that I'll be discussing, but I really hope you enjoy this deep dive. Today I'll be celebrating the 20th anniversary of a glorious achievement in cinema and one of my all-time favourite films. There was never and will never be a film like The Blair Witch Project ever again. I was recently asked by a colleague of mine what my favourite film of all time is. I have plenty of favourite films, but never usually commit to saying, this one is my favourite. But for some reason, The Blair Witch Project was the one that stood out. I'm not saying that The Blair Witch Project is my favourite film of all time, and with the recent releases of films such as Hereditary, Get Out, Midsummer and The Witch, I wouldn't even be able to confidently say that this was my favourite horror of all time but I definitely thought it was worth investigating further. Maybe it was the achievement of what could be done with such a low budget, maybe it was due to the age I saw this film, or maybe it's because after 20 years, this film still gets my heart racing like no other. Let's go get lost in the woods of the Blair Witch Project. Firstly, let's take a look at what is happening in the year of 1999. I was 16 in 1999. We were living in a pre-9-11 world. Bill Clinton and Tony Blair are the leaders of the US and the UK. And in June of 1999, the former was acquitted of the charges held against him for his sexual misdemeanor with a certain Monica Lewinsky. Personal computer sales are booming and the internet is in more homes than ever. The online peer-to-peer file sharing service Napster is released in June, allowing people to share files online in a not-so-legal way. Hope uh, Lars Ulrich and the boys from Metallica aren't listening. The hot Christmas gifts of the previous year were Furbies, Bop It, Nintendo Game Boy Color, Pro-Yo, and Laser Challenge. I have no idea what Pro-Yo is. Maybe it's some kind of uh, proactive yogurt not guessing many children will get that for Christmas. I Want It That Way by the Backstreet Boys storms the chart while a breakout single My Name Is kickstarts the career of Marshall Mathers, also known as Eminem. In 1999, cinemas across the UK had already seen the likes of such classics like The Matrix, The Sixth Sense, American Pie, and South Park released a first feature film with Bigger, Longer and Uncut. And let's not forget the release of a certain space opera, which was back in the cinema after 16 years, after the release of uh, Return of the Jedi in 1983. Maybe more importantly, reality TV was a big thing. It was really starting to take off. Shows like Cops was always on the TV. I remember always sitting down and Cops was on, no matter what time of the day. Cops, Cops, Cops. Uh, The Real World was a big one that was all over the place, always on MTV, and Big Brother had its first ever series in 1999. Not the UK Big Brother with Craig and Nasty Nick, the nasty piece of shit. Uh, No, it was the first season was in the Netherlands. This pre-millennium world was not prepared for what would happen next. The release of a $60,000 found footage production, which was unlike anything we'd seen before, and was due to change the landscape of cinema for years to come. She didn't say anything. 
but she just kept staring and then she right. opened up her shawl. And what was under there? And under it, there was hair on her body like a So horse. she was hairy from head to toe. Let's take a look at the mythology of the Blair Witch Project. Although this film didn't invent found footage or viral marketing, it's an excellent example of how filmmakers can use both tools to elevate a film's status from a B-list blockbuster shelf fodder to a global phenomenon. As I said earlier, PC sales were on an increase, but the internet was not like what it is today, and it was not in as nearly many homes. Going viral was almost impossible in 1999, with the use of dial-up internet and no social media. No Twitter, no Instagram, no Facebook. People didn't fully understand the power of the internet in 1999. The fresh novelty of having the World Wide Web in homes also coincided with people believing everything that was published online. It was treated with almost the same grandeur as a broadsheet newspaper. Well, uh, at least a sleazy tabloid. Daniel Merrick and Eduardo Sanchez utilised the power of this early internet to start a campaign and build a mythology for their film which swept readers into the uncanny world of the Blair Witch. Merrick and Sanchez created an entire backstory and mythology for their witch and for the town of Blair. This fiction was presented as fact and through the use of Fake websites, fake TV news clips, newspapers and police reports, the myth began to pick up steam. The website listed a series of dates logging events going back as far as 1785, up to what was the current time, October 1997. Here are a few examples. February 1785. Several children accused Ellie Kedward of luring them into her home to draw blood from them. Kedward is found guilty of witchcraft, banished from the village during a particularly harsh winter, and presumed dead. November 1786 By midwinter, all of Kedward's accusers, along with half of the town's children, vanish. Fearing a curse, the townspeople flee Blair and vow never to utter Ellie Kedward's name again. May 1941. An old hermit named Rustin Parr walks into a local market and tells people that he's finally finished. After police hike for four hours to his secluded house in the woods, they find the bodies of seven missing children in the cellar. Each child has been ritualistically murdered and disemboweled. Parr admits to everything in detail, telling authorities that he did it for an old woman ghost who occupied the woods near his house. He is quickly convicted and hanged. October 16, 1995. Students from the University of Maryland's Anthropology Department discover a duffel bag containing film cans, dart tapes, video cassettes, a Hi8 video camera, Heather's journal and a CP16 film camera buried under the foundation of a hundred-year-old cabin. When the evidence is examined, Burkittsville Sheriff Ron Cravens announced that the 11 rolls of black and white film and 10 Hi8 videotapes are indeed the property of Heather Donoghue and her crew. The Blair Witch website went live in 1998. The site hosted web headings such as Evidence and The Search, these detailed police searches for the missing students. The site contains realistic, gritty photos of a manhunt using police dogs, uh, so-called found evidence, and Josh's missing car. The site was live prior to the premiere at Sundance, where the film started to gain traction and earn its cult status. Let's look at those initial screenings. Imagine being part of those first audiences, walking into cinemas not knowing what you're about to see and viewing what appears to be a documentary. 
A documentary of three young adults getting lost in the woods, being tormented, tortured and finally murdered by a spiritual presence in a cold dark cabin in a cold dark woods. Woods, I may add, that look just like any wooded area you may be familiar with. There's nothing special, odd or particularly scary about these woods. You may be walking through one right now. Merrick, Sanchez and the studio further fanned the flames of reality by handing out missing posters prior to the Sundance screening. Missing posters which showed the faces of Heather Donoghue, Joshua Leonard and Michael Williams. Three presences who were tactically absent from Sundance and all early screenings of the Blair Witch Project. They were even listed as deceased on IMDb, a stunt which seems highly unlikely to ever be repeated. Now let's look at the making of. This film, which wrapped production on Halloween night in 1997, had a very interesting journey to the screen, and the making of this film is almost as odd as the outcome. In an interview with The Guardian, Merrick said, We set up a base at a house in Germantown, Maryland, that Ed shared with his girlfriend. There were 10 to 15 of us there for six weeks, sleeping on couches and on the floor. The shoot took eight days and was a 24-7 operation. It wasn't like a normal film. The actors would work the cameras, filming each other all the time. Using GPS, we directed them to locations marked with flags or milk crates, where they'd leave their footage and pick up food and our directing notes. End of quote. The film didn't have a conventional script in the way that we're all used to, Improvisation and creativity were at the heart of the film, and everyone was involved. The production seems to have an almost amateur dramatic approach to creativity, a small pack, a troupe, an ensemble if you will. Like a theatre production, everyone chipped in. They all got their hands dirty, there were simple locations and very few props. This almost amdram approach seems to seep through every moment of the Blair Witch Project and only aids in the film creating a realistic documentary feel. Sanchez was quoted in the New York Times saying, The prime directive we had was that the film had to look completely real. The lighting had to make sense, the sound couldn't be great, there wasn't going to be a soundtrack, it was just all edited footage. End of quote. Merrick and Sanchez were more puppet masters than film directors. Instead of directing their cast, they would leave conflicting notes at locations. A note for Heather may highlight the importance of heading south, whilst a note for Josh would state that south was not the way to go and that maybe trusting Heather was a bad idea and don't take no for an answer. The cast had almost as little idea of what was happening as the audience due to watch the film in cinemas worldwide. To give an example of the approach to filmmaking the Blair Witch Project took, it was decided on set that Josh would be the first character to disappear. Originally it was going to be the character of Michael who would go first, but after seeing the footage of Heather and Josh arguing, the decision was overturned. Merrick and Sanchez gave Josh a note saying, when everybody goes to bed tonight, stay awake, and once you're sure they're asleep, leave the tent. If anybody wakes up, tell them you're going to take a piss. The actors, Heather and Michael, were not informed of this decision, and I'm sure this added to their realistic portrayal of fear in the scene where Josh is nowhere to be found. The set became so heated at points that the actors created safe words such as taco for when tempers would flare or when arguments simply went too far. I'm guessing they all never looked at the Mexican snack in the same way ever again.
I'd like to quickly talk through some of my key scenes from the film. Firstly, the investigations. Also, I saw a documentary on the Discovery Channel or somewhere. Really? Once about her, about the ghosts really? and legends of Maryland. Yeah, it's a story my grandmother used to tell us all. Makes us go to bed early. Really? Say if you stay up after dark or walk around the house too much, a Blair Witch would come and get you. Uh, sort of in the winter, I guess, the fall or the winter 1940, uh, some of the young kids started to disappear, and nobody, nobody knew anything about why they were, why they were disappearing. So the creepiest, <laughs> the uh -oh. creepiest story <laughs> kind of about moment, her that I ever heard was that two men were out hunting, uh -huh. and they were camped near the cabin or something that she's supposed to haunt. No, uh -huh. no. And they disappeared off the face of the earth. No. Really? Okay, it's all right, Ingrid. I'm just telling a scary story, but it's not true. It's not true. During the first act of the film, there are scenes of documenting old stories and folk tales from seeming passers-by, and it's absolutely wonderful storytelling. What an inventive way to deliver exposition about the story's antagonist, and although not unique, is perfectly executed. The bickering fisherman arguing over the details of a white, misty object rising out of the water, or the possibly unreliable source of the elderly lady describing a hairy figure reaching out to her but none more terrifying than the mother retelling stories she supposedly heard on the Discovery Channel, again adding weight to the myth about the ghosts of Maryland. She tells the story of a disappearance of two men to the displeasure of her tiny infant daughter, who yells no no and puts her hand over her mother's mouth. This natural reaction of fear from the toddler sells the eeriness of the witch way more than any CGI rendering of Kedward you could possibly get in a future version. The Josh missing scene, or the teeth scene. I once had a conversation with my brother about this scene, and I said, if we were together and we were out in the woods and I went missing and you could hear me screaming in the background but you couldn't find me, what what would you do? And his, his response was, I would just want to die. I think that comment alone really solidifies how scary this sequence is and how that could really affect our protagonists. For the blood-soaked bundle, they used real teeth. They were supplied by Sanchez's dentist and Josh was happy to use some of his own hair for the bundle. Josh! It's over here. No, it's over here. Josh! We'll look for him. I don't know if it's really him. Josh! The children screaming. Michael Williams said the most terrifying moment of the production was hearing the sounds of the children while he was laying in his tent at night. What he didn't know was the sound was actually children that lived across the street from Sanchez's mother being blasted out on three boom boxes in the surrounding area. Not so scary, Michael. Then we get on to Heather's speech. <laughs> I'm scared to close my eyes. I'm scared to open them. So Heather's speech is entirely improvised. Although parodied by Scary Movie to much amusement, the apology to the parents of Josh and Mike through floods of tears and snot is as haunting and affecting to this day. The cabin scene. As we build to the film's climax, Heather and Mike stumble across a cabin in the woods after following the tortured screams of their friend Josh. Imagine being, as Heather states, hungry, cold and hunted, in the woods, losing your friend and hearing their screams in the night. This concept alone is utterly terrifying. Now imagine that those screams are coming from an abandoned, creaky old cabin in the woods. I think we've learnt enough through our cinema history that cabins in the woods are not the place you want to spend a cold, dark night. Mike in the Corner. This single scene absolutely cemented this film as one of my all-time favourites and, in my opinion, is the scariest scene of all time. Everything in the film has built up to this climax in the most subtle, tantalising way and what do we see? Very little. A man stood in the corner of a room before a camera drops to a floor and cuts to black. Doesn't sound so scary. 
But due to the storytelling, due to the little nuggets and treats we've been told along the way about the old man who would make children face the corner, we absolutely know that this means the impending demise of our remaining two characters. Fantastic, wonderful end to a film. Sequels and found footage. Due to the success, a sequel was announced, shot and released only one year later. Book of Shadows, in my opinion, is one of the worst films ever made. Check out our Book of Shadows episode with filmmaker Liam Reagan for more detail on this. The sequel had some fairly interesting ideas, but not only abandoned the found footage approach, which helped Blair Witch Project achieve so much goodwill with its audiences, but they also ditched the less is more approach, which in my eyes is a big mistake. In 2016, Adam Wingard of The Guest fame released Blair Witch, a middling to average attempt to reignite some love for the franchise. This did not take off the way they expected. There's also been a recent Blair Witch video game, of which I've got no knowledge, so I'm not going to uh, dwell on that moment. In my opinion, the film which owes more to the Blair Witch Project has to be Paranormal Activity. This low-budget found footage film was shot independently for $15,000, but gained distribution through Paramount, and the movie eventually grossed nearly $200 million globally, spawning a plethora of sequels of different levels of quality. Also some honourable mentions, Wreck, a Spanish found footage film which goes for a more viral creature feature approach, Cloverfield and Chronicle also used the found footage format with bigger budgets to achieve quite a bit of success, but they could never replicate the realism of the grittier low-budget classic. As you can tell, I'm a big fan of The Blair Witch Project. The film is 20 years old and is still as effective in my eyes as it was in 1999. If this film was released today, the anonymity of the cast would be sniffed out with a quick Google search, the cast would simply not be allowed to be listed as deceased on IMDb, and the quality of cameras on smartphones is 10 times clearer than the footage shot by American Sanchez when they struck lightning in a bottle back in 1999. If you haven't seen The Blair Witch Project, please, after listening to this, go away, watch this film, and witness one of the greatest films of all time. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the Spoilt Milk Movie Podcast, you pieces of fucking shit.